Welcome, panelists, and welcome, dear guests, to today's session on the question, how can the liberal democracies cope with recent global challenges? This is the last of a series of three panel discussions on the great questions of our times and the future of the liberal order. And it marks the 10th anniversary of our project, the Darndorf Forum. The Forum is a joint research initiative by the Hertie School and the London School of Economics and Political Science, and it is funded by Stiftung Mercator. I'm Helmut Anheyer, and the co-director of the Forum, together with Professor Ian Begg of the European Institute at the LSE. This month, the Great Questions of Our Times debate series brought together a diverse group of social scientists in online panel discussions. And we try to unpack some of the questions that we think are timely and relevant in these uncertain times. We pose and explore these questions in the spirit of sociologist Ralph Darndorf, who wrote that intellectuals have the duty to doubt everything that is obvious, to make relative all authority, and to ask all those questions that no one else dares to ask. Now that is a very tall order. The contributions of the individual speakers are also part of a collection of online articles which are about to be published in a journal called Global Perspectives, of which I have the honor of being the founding editor in chief. Because we have asked a very diverse group of social scientists to submit and elaborate on the questions which they think are timely and relevant, we have received a wide variety of contributions. Earlier this month, we held a panel on how can democracy cope with polarization? A second panel followed just a week ago on how the global economy can cope with the current pandemic. Today, we have three distinguished speakers, each having their very own thinking on what they regard as a great question or a puzzle or a topic that is critical for us and the future. I am delighted to welcome Wolfgang Seibel, full professor of politics and public administration at the University of Constance and adjunct professor here at the Hertie School. His research focuses, among other topics, on the political functions of public administration and different types of intermediary organizations. And in recent years, he has focused quite a bit on administrative failures in different uh, political systems and around different fields. On our panel, we also welcome Jan Silonka, Professor of Politics and International Relations at the University of Oxford and in Venice at the University, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, Ka Foscari, and which seems it's a beautiful name and I'm sure it's as beautiful as the name makes it suggest. His main research interests are in the field of European integration, political geography, comparative politics and democracy, and political ideology, most more generally, but especially liberalism, as well as an interest in media and communication. In a few moments, we will be also joined by our third panelist, Joanna Bryson. She's a professor of ethics and technology head of the school. To start, I'm handing over uh, to Jan, uh, who will elaborate on the question, how is liberal Europe challenged by the pandemic? Well, there is no doubt that um, COVID has prompted uh, unprecedented, really unprecedented intervention in our private, economic, but also international life. All uh, ideological, political, and even constitutional equilibria. And those interventions, of course, were not always negative. Some were positive, but even those positive have been controversial because, for instance, pumping huge money into the economy has uh, distributional implications, creating winners and losers. There's always somebody who, who contributes to the money <laughs> which is distributed and those who cash. Intervention in our private life affected really 
basic liberties. And the system of monitoring those rules would imply what I've read in, uh, in Sunday Times uh, just two days ago, a nearly Stasi system to make it function. A, a British peer wrote for this uh, uh, newspaper uh, responding to, to UK law, which was installed uh, yesterday, prohibiting private gatherings in, in homes and gardens of more than six family members and asking, and asking the public to report violations. Uh, so there is a problem, of course. And in some countries, we had a clear power grab. In Poland, my native country, there is a new law considered by, by the parliament, which stipulates that the authorities cannot be held into account if they acted in the vaguely defined social interest during the pandemic. Well, this is the social interest. They, they can do whatever they want if they are not accountable any longer. But even in less extreme cases, I would argue, decisions were uh, largely arbitrary. Why one and not two meter distance? After all, we work with the same science, right? Why gatherings of six and not 30 are banned? In Wales, you can have gatherings of, of 30, in England, six. Why unmarried couples are not treated as married one by many of those regulations? We clearly have seen a rise of paternalistic and in some cases autocratic states acting in a war time fashion coined by, by, by great liberal Macron, practicing the politics of fear and basically manipulating the scientific evidence. And no wonder uh, 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 Alexander Dugin, uh, Putin's uh, ideologue, has announced with satisfaction the total collapse of open society. Well, this is Dugin, but should we worry here in this part of the world, in, in liberal democracies? I think yes, uh, uh, for three reasons. First, because many restrictions and interventions are going to stay, not only because this particular virus is projected to be around yesterday, the news was still 2024, but also because in, in this highly inter interconnected global environment, there will be a new pandemic soon, and we should be prepared for that. The second reason is that exactly when we realize that this world is ever more uh, uh, interconnected, we basically gave up on international organizations to cope with global problems. I mean, uh, not only World Health Organizations, but, but also the UN as such is largely abandoned. And third, and most crucially, our democracies are in crisis and unable to generate the necessary social contract. And without such a contract, it is hard to legitimate the curbs of our liberties. And as you know, a lot of people are very uneasy, if not angry about it. And what can we do? We can, of course, wait hope and pray, but this will not be probably enough. We can depose governments uh, that mishandle the pandemics, but there is no guarantee that the new governments will do any better. This is the history of many revolutions and upheavals. Or we can follow the liberal blueprint and patiently negotiate with each other a set of commonly acceptable solution to this very unprecedented situation. This will be a slow process, but I believe efficiency without legitimacy is an empty share. And where would I start? First, I would delegate some of the state powers to local uh, uh, urban and regional units 
and some others to international units. Well, we, we now just, you know, the states pretend to be only, the only game in town. They say, you know, uh, we rec- have to reclaim sovereignty, you know, we have to close our borders, nobody else is, is, is able to deal with these pandemics. But as we have seen, uh, life on the ground proved different things, that the states were not just unprepared to cope with pandemics, but handled it in most of the cases rather poorly. And we have therefore allowed local and, and transnational actors to step in. And uh, this will have uh, not just uh, efficient efficiency boost, but, but also democratic. You know, democracy in transnational organizations is hampered largely by member states' monopoly on decisions. And delegating powers to local units has uh, one enormous advantage. It enhances participation, which is easy in local units. The second thing, and probably Wolfgang will talk more about this, is to reinforce the public service. After uh, years of no liberal privatizations and regulations, and we need the public sector not just more professional, but also less bureaucratic. The public sector that is not just big, but also wise, cost effective, and responsive to citizens. And, And three, we would need also to reshuffle some functional competences. For instance, security portfolio should include health and environmental matters in addition to military, military ones, because we, learn, we spend a lot of money fi- preparing for a wrong war, so to speak, as, as, as Bill Gates, by the way, five years ago, already uh, warned us about. And this would require reforming institutional structure and budget that this change would imply. But at the end of the day, Whatever we do, we would have to do it together. And unless we somehow reach a consensus in our different communities and across those communities, efforts to, to deal with pandemics will be weak and, and, and poorly legitimized and therefore stirring a lot of anxiety, if not rebellion. Let me ask you to react to the following. Um, usually when you have high degrees of uncertainty, uh, innovations happen. And uh, they typically don't happen in the center of power. They happen more at uh, the fringes, you might say. And they they may not happen in London, but they may happen uh, in other parts of the United Kingdom. They may not happen in Rome, but they're more likely uh, to happen at the outskirts of the political administrative system. Do you see any innovations uh, that have a positive uh, element in them that would make you hopeful? Now, one of the things which we have seen during this pandemic uh, uh, was that, that, that contributions to, to a, of, of science and scientists, mm-hmm. decision-making, uh, this uh, has very often be, been more... Uh, apparent and real. We have to face this. We have seen uh, the battles between, for instance, President Trump and 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 uh, and Dr. Fauci, uh, and 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 most of us would probably prefer to be in the hands of of Dr. Fauci. But at the end of the day. Um, we cannot do without politicians because think, uh, those are elected and accountable and, and, and scientists uh, are not. And, and we have seen that, that science has been used and misused by politicians in this crisis and a lot of uh, uh, conflicting pressure uh, put on decision makers. So, so this experiment of including scientists into decision making it has a mixed record, yeah? A more interesting experiment was basically empowering local actors because uh, we, we've seen that with the pandemics, 
immediately governments reclaim sovereignty and they say we will deal uh, with, with, with these pandemics within national borders. Actually, they seal those national borders. But they very cl- quickly learn that actually this doesn't make much sense because uh, 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 where you need to put the border is uh, around the center of, of infection. And this is very often a small city, not even region. And why would, for instance, people be Italians uh, uh, from Lombardy would be free to, to travel to Napoli where there were hardly any infections and, and not free to travel to, to London where, where there were equally many or even more infections, right? Or to Belgium, right? Uh, so we, we, we have seen that, 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 that here very important things have happened. That, that, that local um, actors actually proved not just closer to, to citizens, but also uh, more in a position to, to deal with problems which they arise. Mm. Uh, yeah. And the same happened on the international level. Look, uh, the, the recovery fund is a very good example. We, we thought the EU is unable any longer to show a level of solidarity. And yet they agreed on a package, which is maybe not to the liking of, of, of everybody, but which shows that we cannot just do on our own. Mm-hmm. And you can continue. So, so the experiments have been made and and some of them will fly because uh, the proof of the pudding is in eating and not in the recipe which you read in the book. Right? Yeah, there is a question that uh, has just come in from, from Ian Begg from uh, the LSC. And uh, uh, he says that a science, science in this case about uh, the virus, uh, is uncertain and politicians face an enviable challenge in reconciling health and economic imperatives. And he wonders if you're not too harsh on politicians. Well, I, I, Ian is absolutely right. Uh, but uh, um, this uncertainty concerns not only science, it also concerns politicians. They always have to make decisions uh, 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 somehow in the dark. The question is, do they totally turn their back on science or they try to use science and inform their decisions by it? Mm. And we have seen uh, different kind of politicians here. And, 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 and it's clear that some of those politicians turn their back on science and some of them try to use science as much as possible, but understood that there is a... Uh, uh, not only there are not only different branches of medical science because public health experts will tell you different stories than virologists, for instance, yeah. but also that there is uh, 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 there is uh, not just uh, uh, medical science, there is also uh, uh, economic science. Uh, if you agree, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, move on and ask Wolfgang to uh, summarize his, uh, his paper for us. Thank you, Jan, and Wolfgang, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Helmut. Yeah. And thank you very much for having me anyway. My, my topic is, um, at first glance, totally different from Jan's, but, um, well, only at first glance, because it is about one of the fundamental uh, characteristics and tensions at the same time of the process of European integration, basically about the uh, tension between commitment and compliance, which sometimes is overlooked, especially in research about the European Union itself, uh, of which I am not an expert. Uh, and the topic is uh, also very uh, concrete and, and uh, virulent um, subject of political debates both internationally and domestically in Germany, namely the uh, well, second gas pipeline through the Baltic Sea known as Nord Stream 2. 
And my brief essay, which uh, has no more than four and a half pages, is entitled uh, Nord Stream 2, Can Germany Escape from the Non-Compliance Trap? And that is exactly what I will elaborate, in, uh, elaborate on in the, in the remainder of this brief uh, presentation. Well, you will all know, I guess, what, um, what the basics of, of this, uh, what some call just an infrastructure project uh, is. It is the second gas pipeline. It will uh, double the capacity of Russian gas pumped directly to, to Germany, uh, and it is fiercely disputed. And uh, one reason is that the traditional transit country, which is Ukraine, will lose this role as a transit country for natural gas and at the same time will lose uh, transit fees uh, in the order of several uh, billions of uh, US dollars per year. Uh, while at the same time, Russia, in the perception of many, including myself, uh, will uh, win leverage vis-a-vis -vis both Germany and third-party countries. Uh, many of them, if not most of them, are closely connected with the German economy, So, which partly already explains the strong German interest in uh, Nord Stream uh, 2. You also will have heard about uh, the U.S. sanctions. Um, uh, against uh, everybody who in uh, no matter what way supports the completion of Nord Stream 2, which is near to completion, as you might also know. And the last measure uh, was the uh, U.S. Protecting Europe's Energy and Security Act of December 2019, which uh, is fiercely criticized again, I like to say rightly so, here in this country as so-called extraterritorial sanctions, although those German complaints are sometimes hard to understand precisely because it is a kind of gray rhino phenomenon in the sense that, well, everybody could have seen it, everybody could have noticed that uh, those sanctions are in the office. Nonetheless, Germany kept to the project. And that is uh, exactly uh, the point or, or uh, brings me to the point uh, and of uh, commitment versus uh, compliance. I mean, the commitment of Germany to the European Union its spirit and its standards certainly is beyond reasonable doubt, but Nord Stream 2 is a prominent example of German non-compliance because it violates the third energy package of the European Union and the so-called gas directive, which is based on this third energy uh, package. That, from the very outset, from the first planning of this uh, second pipeline through the uh, Baltic Sea, has triggered uh, fierce protests. Uh, out of the middle of the European Union, um, a letter of, of uh, 10 EU member states, as far as I recall, was uh, sent in November 2015 already to the EU Commission in protest against the project. In November th uh, 2018, an open letter of uh, some 100 EU, EU uh, members of parliament to Chancellor Merkel herself was sent and the perception outside Germany is primarily that this is a German project, basically as a spirit or a logic of Germany first at the expenses of EU member states, especially besides Ukraine. I mean, Ukraine is not a member state, but especially as far as Poland, Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia are concerned. At the same time, enhancing Russian leverage, like I said, and Russia, uh, which itself uses literally every means to weaken the European Union uh, so far and so much um, uh, to the geopolitical uh, and, uh, dimension. The more narrow institutional dimension is, like I said, the incompatibility of Nord Stream 2 with the third energy package and the gas directive. And here the crucial element again is the so-called unbundling uh, principle, which means the uh, requirement of the separation of gas production and the transmission by our transmission and networks. So this is a criterion of uh, Gazprom as the owner of uh, the Nord Stream uh, company uh, cannot, uh, cannot fulfill, and that is precisely because the entire project is basically against EU uh, and violates EU regulation. So far, so good. Then came the game changer. The game changer was uh, that Russian opposition leader, Alexei Navalny, was poisoned with a nerve agent uh, on a flight back to Moscow. 
uh, the pilot made the wise and courageous decision uh, of emergency landing against the advice, by the way, of the ground control in, um, in Omsk. And it turned out when, um, when um, Navalny was uh, transferred to Germany, uh, to Berlin, to the charity hospital, uh, that uh, uh, he had been of fallen prey to attempted murder uh, with a nerve agent of the uh, infamous Novichok uh, group, just like Sergei Kripal in the UK in 2018. Then on September the 2nd, uh, German Chancellor Merkel, uh, in a spectacular step, uh, unusual for her standards, at a public appearance before the International Press Corps, and she pronounced uh, the uh, attempted murder of Alexei Navalny, an unacceptable crime. And of course, we need to see the context here. There was uh, the uh, Russian cyber attack on the uh, German uh, Bundestag in 2015. Uh, there was a German man gunned down in public in Berlin in August last year turned out to be a hit ordered by the Russian uh, government and the perpetrators actually in custody here in uh, this country. And uh, well, uh, taken all together, uh, also including a statement made by Foreign Minister Heiko Maas, this was the first time that an abandonment of Nord Stream 2 was, is officially, or was and still is officially considered by key figures of the federal government because uh, both the Foreign Minister and the Chancellor uttered that they are of the opinion uh, that uh, they, they expressed the hope, rather, that uh, Russia will not force Germany to change the position on Nord Stream 2. So uh, let me let me um, come to um, my final um, statement, basically. So um, my argument is this could be, believe it or not, a Darendorf moment. So a window of opportunity for what I call in my essay a win-win solution, because uh, it is about abandonment of Nord Stream 2 by a variety of reasons. And the converging point is to strengthen Germany's credibility and the EU at the same time, because it is a question of credibility of Germany's commitment to the cause of the EU as far as the legal order is concerned. It is uh, uh, about solidarity and cohesion within the EU, especially with respect to nations whose collective memory is shaped by the experience that the German-Russian understanding, let alone alliances, were all too often designed to neglect, if not to violate the vital national interests and ultimately uh, it would underline the abandonment of Nord Stream to the indispensability of a crystal clear message to Russia that state-sponsored murder with a nerve agent banned by the Chemical Weapons Convention will trigger resolute restrictive measures against Russia. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Wolfgang. Uh, in a moment, we'll uh, turn over to uh, Joanna. But Perhaps one quick question that uh, comes to mind. Um, you uh, write in your paper, I'm referring to Darendorf's idea, uh, that the nation state's commitment to multilateral institutions can only be guaranteed insofar that their domestic policies allow for it. And uh, now, is uh, what happens with Nord Stream 2 a case of that? And what, but what happened to uh, what we saw in the UK Parliament last night? where the, apparently the, uh, the current government wants to renege on the Brexit uh, opinion. Uh, will we see more of these uh, changes, changing course in the future? Well, um, as they say, um, I never make predictions, especially not on the future. So, um, but there are parallels. And I think the problem in Germany was the slow emergence and the uh, of the visibility of the incompatibility of this project Nord Stream 2 with uh, basic principles and and institutional rules of the European Union and there was heavy uh, big business lobbying and it was also uh, a case of elite failure especially within the ministry of the economy and energy during the time when at the helm of that ministry 
uh, were social democrats and uh, well also widely known i guess the key figure here is a former social democratic uh, chancellor gerhard schroeder who of course used his key position to influence his fellow party members of the social democratic party so there is no iron law or something like that it very much depends on the attentiveness and the commitment of course but also of the skill of politicians to avoid the uh, deep rift between commitment and compliance that came to the fore in the case of Nord Stream uh, 2. So it is very much about mindfulness, very much about reminding ourselves what we actually uh, do and how well we operationalize those uh, values uh, at the level of the general commitment to the EU to the very concrete measures and the very concrete uh, and uh, well acute necessities of, of displaying actual compliance and Nord Stream uh, to sad enough is a case of non-compliance but it had not been framed as such so far in the dominant German discourse unlike outside Germany by the way. Yeah so I have several questions from uh, from the audience and uh, I'm, I'm working on a computer that is not mine so um, yeah Here's, here's a very controversial one to Wolfgang. Um, and um, it says, how can Wolfgang Seibel uh, call a darned off moment his proposal to succumb to unilateral sanctions contrary to business and human interests in climate protection? Uh, my um, counter question is, um, uh, what, what kind of unilateral sanctions are meant here? Uh, the, probably the United States, the U.S. sanctions. Yeah. Well, I do not support that uh, kind of um, uh, uh, sanctions. I, I think I mentioned that. I rather wanted to emphasize that this already is a unilateral perception and that especially the Germans are good advised to remember that they are member, after all, of a supranational organization called the European Union and that the European Union has a common energy policy uh, as part of the single European market based on particular principles. And as far as natural gas supply is concerned, the uh, main aspect here is the third energy package of 2009 with its gas directive that is based on that. And from all, from, from this, well, the remainder of my argument uh, followed. So that is why, I just wanted to point to one aspect that is largely neglected, at least, at least in the domestic discussion in this country, uh, which is that uh, Germany is in infringement with uh, Nord Stream 2 of exactly those basic EU principles and regulation. There's a question from uh, Ian, Ian Beck at the LSC. Uh, two points for Wolfgang. First, there is a huge investment in the, newly, in the nearly complete uh, pipeline should it just be abandoned? Second, following your logic, should Nord Stream 1 not also be shut down uh, despite the damage it would cause to the German economy? Well, Nord Stream 1, uh, which is not an official name for the first uh, uh, pipeline, uh, I mean, this is a done deal. And I mean, we, we should cross the bridges we reach. And it is now about a Nord Stream 2. And this is the issue at stake. And the licensing process uh, with the uh, so-called Bundesnetzagentur here in um, this country is not completed yet. And it is about mobilizing arguments in favor of a measure that should have been taken long before, which is the abandonment of Nord Stream 2. Which brings me to your first question. Uh, namely, what about the investments? I mean, the investments were made uh, by managers, by people, also by politicians, who know that this was a risky endeavor. If you invest in something of which you should know, it is incompatible with regulation. I mean, that's ultimately your problem. So if you are acting under the illusion of something and now and then ultimately the consequences of illusion come to, well, uh, to whom would you like to shift the blame then? 
uh, certainly not to those who ultimately decide also Germany as a member of the European Union has to comply with European Union regulation. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, Jan, how, uh, how does uh, the debate at the moment play out in uh, uh, Poland when it comes to Nord Stream? Well, majority uh, of uh, political parties are against this deal. What, what I find a little bit puzzling is, because, uh, is how this discussion has changed over um, uh, four decades. Because uh, I used to work with my German colleagues in the early 80s on export controls and American sanctions uh, after the uh, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, where Germany was also at the center of all debates. Be and the argument at the time was, yes, we don't like the Soviet Union, uh, uh, but uh, we believe that if we continue trading with them, we will generate... Um, a, a political change there because trade somehow socialize other actors, make them more dependent on, on revenue, on working with us. And in the end, the, the idea was uh, that um, you, you, you deal with, with, with the danger through what, what the Germans famously called the tan politics and trade involvement rather than by sanctions which hurt largely Western contractors rather than um, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Soviet Union itself. Now, I've noticed with interest that today conversation is totally di different. First, there is the climate change argument, which at the time was largely absent, and second, there is um, the EU argument, which, which has been made much more uh, powerful at the time uh, the EU wouldn't mingle on such matters. Uh, and, but I ask myself, where is the general strategy of dealing with even more assertive Russia? And how you actually uh, uh, should... Um, should respond to, to, to behavior, which is obviously deplorable on a number of fronts, because it's not only poisoning uh, political opponents, it's also the, the issue of, 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 of Ukraine and Crimea and, uh, and numbers of other, uh, you know, mingling in, uh, in elections and so forth. And we haven't had somehow a, 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 a equally comprehensive debate today on these issues as we had four decades ago when we dealt actually with similar or some would argue much greater uh, uh, threat coming uh, from, from the East. And this is for me puzzling. This debate doesn't take place in Poland and, uh, and I wonder whether it doesn't take place in America and I wonder what about Germany, which is again in the center of, 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 very, of, a, of a debate and controversy. Uh, the, when I follow it, I have very much deja vu. Mm. Thank you. But perhaps you can ask uh, Wolfgang to uh, take this up. Uh, where is the debate in, in Germany? And uh, Joanna, if uh, we also can link it to the debate on uh, uh, AI and robotics, perhaps in Germany. And uh, since you know the US quite well, perhaps you could refer to that. Uh, Joanna is a professor of ethics and technology here at the Hertie School. And before joining Hertie, she was um, a, a, a member of the computer science faculty at the University of Bath. So, Joanna, uh, over to you. As you can see from the topic, uh, you know, it's kind of fundamental. And I don't want to sound stupid talking about the basic fundamental value of human lives. But it's what I keep running into that summarizes the confusions people have about AI and then the exploitation that we've been seeing at the transnational level of people's uh, naivete uh, in, in terms of avoiding regulation uh, in order to, by exploiting people's over uh, interpretation of what it is uh, to have artificial intelligence. 
I came into artificial intelligence ethics because I was just trying to learn how to build, uh, trying to learn, I was trying to develop how to build AI more successfully because I wanted to use it to better understand human intelligence. So I was that my, my interest in systems artificial intelligence, the engineering of artificial intelligence is to do science and is for scientific simulation. Um, but I was working on this robot that you can see to your right, which was shaped like a person. Now, it didn't work at all. This is completely just a statue basically posed to look like the thinker. People felt ethical obligation towards that. On the left is you know, me as a young person, but also a robot that did work. And nobody said, oh, I have ethical obligation to that robot, okay? That was a much more complicated robot. It had more sensors, more actuators, and it actually functioned. The one on the right doesn't even have a CPU at this point. And yet people were proud that they could generalize from the women's movement and the civil rights movement to, to extend their, uh, their obligations, their, their feeling of morality and moral agency to this pile of metal. And I, I was, if you think that um, what you've learned from uh, the civil rights movement and the um, feminist movement is that that pile of metal is as much like a white male as, as, uh, as I am, <laughs> then I think that we have a failure of the civil rights and the feminist movements. I don't think we're, our, our task is completed. Well, anyway, so I wrote a few papers about that. Not much. It's not really science. It was just occasional rants. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, people started caring about AI, and I started calling, being called to the table. So I want to show you just a couple of graphs. I'm sorry that I forgot that I had this build, so let me do this. Um, so I often am talking to people about employment and, and they think that robots are gonna take all the jobs. Look, if I wrote some software that made a teacher twice as effective as that teacher would have been, there's nothing in that statement that says whether we have twice as good of schools or half as many teachers, right? That is a political decision. And yet there's a whole lot of people talking about uh, techno-determinism that believe that as a consequence of uh, changes in technology, we necessarily will wind up in a different place. So I really, really want to uh, echo what, what Professor Seibel just said, and uh, it, it is absolutely about people realizing that we need to make good, hard decisions and not thinking that there's a, necess there's a necessary fact of the matter about where society goes as we introduce technology. But that is, again, one of the things that people evading uh, regulation have been saying, like, you just don't understand AI, let me tell you how it's going to go, okay? I do think also that, that one of the pressures here is this concern about whistleblowers, and this is the main point of my talk. I'm worried that there are some governments that are, and, and it may be one that was mentioned earlier, uh, that, that are put more interested in investing in technology than in keeping their own populations alive. All right, so that is the bottom, the bottom line of why I was trying to write this paper. Um, I want to show, this is something I just learned at Herdy School last week, although it's not Herdy School's work, it's uh, uh, Perelin's work, but, and it was also done, i sorry, there must be another build here, there we go, sorry. Uh, uh, colleagues at UCL have done some related work for Germany, this is American numbers. People think that AI is going to take all the jobs that have repetitive components. But this paper was supposed, again, the guy who wrote the paper didn't even see what I saw immediately in this graph. He was worried about the impact of unions. And yes, unions matter, but I've only got five minutes. What I want you to look at is that here is the decline of wages of non-union members in the United States um, who had these repetitive tasks that AI was supposed to take. And it all happens between 1983 and 1995. And I said, why, why, what, wait, then what about AI? And they said, oh, we have a theory in economics that there hasn't been any good AI in the 21st century. This is absolutely rubbish. But what did happen there, there's a, there's a professor at MIT, David Otter, there's a lot of people that looked at this. This is when there were humans that were, coming, that were competing with American workers. And what uh, Zussman and Schoenberg have shown is that in Germany, wages declined for this class of workers when the Iron Curtain came down, right, with the fall of the wall, when there was plausible other people nearby that you could actually outsource some of your uh, automobile, automotive industry to, that was when the German unions accepted a, a, a decline in wages. So um, I want to say uh, quickly, political polarization is directly correlated 
with uh, wealth inequality. Again, these are American numbers, I apologize for that. But I, I want to emphasize what this question about that we just heard, you know, the, the, the about um, is this entropy going to increase? Yes, as long as we keep allowing individuals to, to accumulate so much uh, power, when you have the smaller number of people with more power, the more entropy. And this was something that, you know, in the late 19th century, you can read people like, you know, Churchill when he was still liberal, saying, like, what is going on? Why is it getting harder to govern? And, and then they started looking at the German welfare state and saying, maybe we should do that. After World War I and, and the financial crash, they finally had enough political impotence that both in America and Britain, they were able to start bringing down the, the, the inequality and because they got the political uh, uh, working. And then, of course, uh, in 1945, you had things like Bretton Woods, where a lot of the elite, it doesn't have to be all, but enough of them realized that the entropy they were creating was jeopardizing their own interests, as well as the interests of the vast majority of humanity. So uh, I'm skip over that. The, the, the British situation, uh, that it looks as if it's Saudi Arabia, that the financial industry has done the regulatory capture that, may, that has created poverty, extreme poverty, within one of the richest countries in the world. Just unbelievable, right? So this is my question. This is my last slide. This is the question I, I already said. Is it possible that some governments are willing to let citizens and residents die because they think technology is, is better for whatever the goal is? I guess the goal is security, their personal security. This is my concern right now. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, uh, I have one um, a question for you. When, when your last slide, right? Uh, but in following on, on what Wolfgang said, is do, don't we have to be a bit more specific what, what we mean by governments, yeah? Right. Okay. Well, yeah, so, so in technology, uh, uh, there's a lot of people saying, why don't we let the, gover the companies uh, govern themselves? Of course. Okay, so when I talk about governance, and I am in Herdy's uh, Center for Digital Governance, when I talk about governance, I'm talking about, um, well, okay, let's back up one, regulation. Regulation is the means by which any entity perpetuates itself into the future, okay? So genes regulate themselves, right? There's gene regulatory networks. They're, they're animals regulate ourselves. We breathe and things like that. We're perpetuating ourselves into the future. Governance is the subset of all that regulatory activity that's deliberate, that we actually talk about, that we negotiate. Governments are just one part of governance. So of course, companies have to self-govern, otherwise they aren't here tomorrow. But it is easier for them to govern themselves <clears throat> and to perpetuate themselves if they coordinate their activity with other members of society and governments are ways that we do that. So they're, they're, it's useful to have the, the fact that we have uh, interests with our neighbors, we will always have interests, you know, in a climactic resource, all this, these things we're just talking about, you know, the, who our neighbors are, are, our more distant neighbors are, where we get our pipelines from. That is a geographic fact, and it makes sense for us to have a government to help coordinate those interests. But it also makes sense that we need to realize that, that we have these transnational interests now, and some governance will be done through the corporations and other, other entities, the UN, other, other sorts of, you know, the Red Cross has become a, a useful tool for communicating about certain kinds of problems. You only have about two minutes each, and then uh, unfortunately our time is up. So over to you, Wolfgang. Yeah, uh, well, the irony uh, in the domestic debate in Germany about foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia is that those who advocate uh, not to return to the Cold War and for that reason are in favor of friendly relationship with Russia uh, are doing that with a Cold War mindset. And uh, that means that, well, during the Cold War, the Soviet Union was interested in stability. It was uh, interested in maintaining the status quo. Today, Russia is interested in the opposite. Russia displays a policy uh, well, banking on well, what is called freezing and defreezing conflicts. You see that in Ukraine and you, of course, uh, well, the sad example of Syria. So for Russia, uh, out of basically weakness and uh, or lack of capability to be a constructive actor in the international relations, it is already enough to well demonstrate well 
we are still here. We are still there. And don't forget us. Please treat us as grown-ups. And this is exactly what my recommendation is. We need to treat our Russian friends, and I consider myself to be a Russian Versteher and Russian Russland Versteher. So I try to understand the logic of the disposition of Russian foreign policy. We need to treat our Russian friends as grown-ups, and we need to take seriously what they do. If they well, perpetrate murder in the middle of Berlin, they have to deal with the consequences. And if they use an internationally banned nerve agent, they have to face the consequences. It's as simple as this. So not thinking in terms of the Cold War in order to avoid a new Cold War. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Joanna? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, the, the, when you reduce the cost, the digital revolution, as some previous technological revolutions, reduce the cost of distance. And so that changes a lot, right? Russia is nowhere near where China or America are with respect to AI, but it doesn't need to be because it is able to disrupt, you know, fundamentally. I mean, look what the direct disruption to NATO of the elections in, in Britain and, and America. So it, it is about, uh, again, I think it's a fallacious model, believing that by having weaker countries around you, you will keep your own uh, citizens from unrest, that they'll stop demanding things that, that you don't want to provide. So I, I think that, uh, like I, there, there, there has been this effort right, right now, the G7 created something called the Global Partnership on AI. And I'm hoping, I've, I, and Germany has nominated me only six months after coming here to be one of the representatives there. So I'm hoping that we will uh, push forward on things like the digital tax, some of these other uh, financial uh, considerations that will help us with the stabilization. Um, but I also, we, we do have to also just do personal diplomacy, science, humanities, communicating better models of stability and, and governing, and yes, of cooperation to, to all of our potential friends and colleagues. Yeah, well, thank you so very much um, to the three panelists. This concludes, I think, this uh, three panel uh, discussion and it also um, concludes the uh, Darndorf Forum, which will come to an end by um, in October, uh, the latest. It's been 10 very productive, fruitful, fascinating years, and we hope to organize something like the Darndorf Forum in the future. Thank you again, everybody, and God bless. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Darndorf Forum in the future. Thank you again, everybody, and God bless. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.